Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast. I'm your host, Zach Bitter, and I want to welcome everyone to this episode of the show. As a way to thank the listeners for helping me grow this podcast over the years, I'm going to continue a raffle option for all of you to have a chance to win a free consultation with me. So it's a 30 minute consultation that I will raffle off once per month. All you have to do to enter is share the episodes that you enjoy on whatever platform you find most interesting. The only thing I ask you to do is if it's a social media channel, make sure you tag me so I see it and can save that and enter in the raffle. Or if it's somewhere else that you can't tag me at, take a screenshot and send that to me at hpopodcast at gmail.com. You can also enter the raffle by writing a show review on your favorite podcast listening platform. So if you do that, take the screenshot, send it to hpopodcast at gmail.com, and I will enter you in that monthly raffle. Also, I'm excited to announce that I launched a new group coaching option. So to go along with my personalized one-on-one coaching options and my pre-made plans that I have on my website at ZachBitter.com, this year I'm starting a group of online endurance runners who want to work with me in a slightly different model. So this model is set up so that whether you're a beginner or advanced, you can join. Whether you're training for something like a 5K or something as far as a 200 plus miler, you are welcome and this setup will help you reach your goals. The way I have it set up is if you subscribe, you will have access to my full catalog of training plans which range from beginner 5K all the way up to advanced 200 plus miles. Along with that plan that you're going to use, you will have access to a weekly group meeting where you can ask questions about training, you can ask about adjustments to the plan to make it more personalized to you, you can engage with the other group members if you want. We'll get you all set up and ready to really personalize that plan to make sure that you're heading in the right direction for your event. Also, you will have access to office hours where if you have something you want to ask and you want to just hop in and ask a question, you'll be given access to that as well. I will be bringing in guest speakers who have a deep understanding of specific topics and things that we'll use to better your training and recovery process throughout the course of the year as well as a private forum for all the members to engage with one another, share stories, share training tips, and just house a lot of the information that we'll go over on the daily and weekly basis as you're pursuing your race goals. So if you're interested in checking that out, just head to my website at zachbitter.com, go to the coaching tab. From there, you'll be directed to the team coaching option, and you can sign up for that and get onboarded to join the group. If you're interested in keeping up with what I'm up to, please give me a follow on some of my socials. Follow me on Instagram at Zach Bitter, on X, Twitter at Z Bitter, and check out the brand new HPO podcast handles, which are just at HPO podcast on Instagram and X slash Twitter. Of course, all this stuff can be found quite easily on my website, which is the main landing page for everything I do at ZachBitter.com. Here are some discounts and promos for the HPO sponsors. I have a full breakdown of how I use each of these products at the end of every episode. S Fuels has a 15% site-wide discount and right now are running a free 30-serving pack of their S Fuels train product with promo code HPO train. Hurry up on this one though. They have a limited number of supplies. Go to sfuelsgolonger.com, promo code HPO train. John G Apparel has 10% off with promo code BITTER10. Check out their AFO shorts if you're in the market for a new pair of running or gym shorts. That's johnji.com, J-A-N-J-I.com. Element Electrolytes has a free sample pack with purchase and satisfaction guarantee, meaning if you don't like it, they will give you your money back. No question to ask. You don't even have to return the box. Go to drinklmnt.com forward slash HPO to get that free sample pack and try out all their flavors with your purchase. Finally, Delta G Ketones has 20% off with Bitter20 promo code, and they also offer free consultations to help you assess how their product would best fit your lifestyles. Head to Delta G Ketones.com. All links 
promos and discounts can be found in the show notes as well as every episode landing page. All right, Rory, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Zach. I'm excited to chat. Yeah, I can safely say you're the fastest marathoner to join my podcast. So it's going to be fun to talk to you. That's an honor. I mean, you must not interview too many marathoners then. (laughs) <laughs> there's just not too many faster than you these days 208 is pretty impressive time it was exciting to see you uh hit that standard and um i know the the selection process is never easy for the olympics regardless of what country you're from but it seems like it's pretty safe as far as safe bets go you're going to be at the paris olympics racing the marathon this this year yeah i mean i'm planning on that and i'm i'm preparing as if that's that's the case but the caveat is there are guys gunning for me. So in, in a world where sure. they have great days, uh, there's, a, there's always a chance, but I feel good about it. Like you said, it's, it's, like, mm-hmm. it's likely. So they have, uh, they, the Olympic qualifying window is open till May 5th. So there's a few opportunities left that are good that I know of a few guys going for the standard. And, you know, it's, nobody's done that yet. So it'd be, it would be take two new people running lifetime best by a, a good margin to, to jump over me. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I'm, I'm in a great spot and I'm excited about that. So right now I'm just working backwards from the Olympic games and, and treating it as if I'm going, cause that's what I think I need to do to give myself the best chance to be ready. No doubt. Yeah. Yeah. And for, for, Canada selection, are they, they're doing it kind of on a body of work sort of thing, as long as you have the standard. Yeah, that's what they, they've left it pretty ambiguous on purpose. I think Um, it's the way I, I mean, I'm not the kind of guy to like crunch the selection criteria and like know exactly the ins and outs, but Ryan did go on a meeting that was sent out to all the marathon coaches that of, of hopeful athletes at the beginning of the, the onset of the Olympic games, like window and they said that they would consider multiple things and and one being previous world champs performance which i feel like i've done well at the last two world championships so i think that puts me in a good spot and then also obviously you have to qualify that this is the hardest olympic game marathon to qualify the most exclusive field they've had capping it at 80 you know obviously there's a chance there's more than 80 if a bunch of people are on the standard but as of right now i think only 67 men with the three per country have run that standard in the world. So it seems unlikely that 13 new ones uh, will, will come in the next two months. So it, it is, it is looking like it'll be the most exclusive Olympic marathon of all time. Usually Olympic marathons are closer to hundred in field size. So cutting it by 20% is substantial. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting times. I know it's been kind of fun to follow the, the American marathoners through the Olympic trials recently. And, and I know you're, I mean, you're in it. So it's one of those things where I'm always curious uh, for someone like yourself who, you know, you, you raced in college at BYU, you are, I'm friends with and uh, familiar with a lot of the American runners. It must be kind of a weird situation to sit there and watch the Olympic trial marathon thinking like, man, these are guys I've raced, um, given your more recent result. And then watching that, knowing, uh, knowing the results of uh, Connor Mance and, and Clayton Young thinking like, man, what would it be like if I were in there mixing up with those guys? <laughs> yeah, that's human nature to, to project yourself into a race you're watching. I feel like every year I watch the Boston Marathon or the New York Marathon or Chicago, London, whatever it is, Tokyo this last weekend. And I always want to put myself like, oh, what would, what, where would I be in this in this world? And you know, a lot of times the answer is like, not there. Like, right? like if you're watching Tokyo, I'm not mm-hmm. going out in 61 minutes or whatnot. But in that uh, Olympic Marathon trials, it was a it was a really unique uh, race the way it played out. I loved watching it. I thought it was one of the more entertaining products I've I've watched as far as marathoning goes. With the way Zach Panning raced, someone I've raced a few times before and have great respect for. Obviously, my college teammates Connor Mance and Clayton Young, uh, the way they raced and my experience just knowing who they are and how they train and a lot about them. It's it's hard not to be like, man, I wish I was in this race to just see like measure yourself up against them. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's really cool. And it's one of those things that I'm just like, I finished watching that marathon and like, I needed like a two day cooling off period. I was so lucky that 
yeah. my marathon wasn't like the same weekend because I would have absolutely lost my race by just how much that worked me up. Just like being like, oh, I got to make this team now. This was like so motivating and like kind of gave me a real fire under my ass more so than I expected. Yeah. Yeah, it was fun. I actually rewatched that race last night. Uh, it's just one of those things where like when you can watch – you know, just over two hours of racing. There's so many little things that you notice when you watch it a second time and just listening to the commentary and stuff like that. It was, it, it was interesting. Cause I think like following it, you know, you could tell Zach obviously went out hard, um, went for it and he sort of needed to, I guess, given the criteria for selection and things like that. But it's just one of those things where like, he's looking strong, looking strong. And I think it was maybe around mile 22, maybe closer to 23, you can kind of start to see the fatigue on his face start to show up and you're just like, that's good. It's like three miles probably as you're watching him approach that spot, you're thinking that's not much distance, but it sure is when you're leading a race that long and then also going out on a pace that is, uh, is new for you. Yeah. It was just a, such a fun thing to, to pay attention to, but um, yeah, when you're watching something like that, are you, what are you paying attention to, to try to see like, okay, who's got, who's got a little bit of gas in their tank, who's going to fade. Do you have anything that you're paying attention to for that? I would say as someone who races all these guys, like on the U S circuit and, and throughout the NCAA system and has known a lot of these guys for some time and, you know, I've trained with some of them, some of them have been teammates and whatnot. I'm looking more so like what do I know about these athletes and, and what does it tell me with what they're doing? Like with Clayton, the way his build was, uh, you know, through Chicago coming off Chicago, following along on his training, I knew he was in a really good place and the way he was just in it, like Clayton, I almost was like, okay, Clayton's making this team. And then Connor was the safest bet in the world because of the talent. Like he's just, he's just, probably the best prospect to come out of the NCAA that's went straight to the marathon in recent years. Right. So it's like, you have these two guys and I'm like, okay, it feels like they're kind of a lock at like 18 miles in that race. I was like, they, these guys look great. They're right there. And I actually thought Zach was, was going to make that team. Cause I, I had followed his training closely and I was like, this guy's fit. He's really fit. And, mm -hmm. and I respected what he did in Budapest. And obviously Orlando was warm. So there was like a little bit of that, like he's been there before with warmer races, but I think he did get, and he, he admitted this in his post-race interview, he got too excited. He got too worked mm -hmm. up in the marathon, you know, rewards, patience, and kind of holding back for as long as you can before you strike. And I think had he at 18, 19, 20 miles, when they clearly broke away and showed that those three were the fittest on the day, if he had just taken the edge off the pace, I think for the next 5k to four miles i think he makes it to the finish line in third i think it was just like he was thinking like i'm trying to win this race and trying to make sure i'm top two for the qualification stuff but i think if he was third he was going to go probably so in hindsight taking the edge off after you've kind of made the race would have been the smart move but you live and you learn the marathon is a cruel teacher uh, in that way no doubt about it. And it's, it's the, I always say the marathon has to be one of the hardest races because it's this perfect balance between it's far, you're going to be out there a long time, but it's short enough where the intensity, when you get the best in the world, all optimizing for it is very fast. So you're out there in a situation where you have to be on for a couple hours and one mistake is the potentially the difference between, you know, someone like Zach getting third versus, uh, you know, sixth place. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, such a fun, fun event to follow. Um, I want to jump into your most recent marathon. That is, uh, you know, I would imagine one of the more exciting races of your career for you, your splits, <laughs> you, uh, you ran a, a two Oh eight Oh one and you literally went, was it 104 and then 104.01 or was it the other way around? I've heard it said to me both ways. I can't tell you. I think I remember looking at the clock because they had a clock at halfway and I thought I ran 103.59. So it was probably 104 for the first one. I remember looking at it and be like, oh, we're sub 64. That's great. We're on, we're on pace here. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it was 64, 64.01. But yeah, it was, it was very even. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's interesting because it's like, first of all, 208.10 is the number you're looking for on that day because that's what gets you the Olympic qualifier uh, or hit the Olympic standard, I should say. It's it's something where you, I'm sure we can get in kind of the training that you did. I'd be interested in kind of like what workouts you did that would maybe be suggestive of like, okay, 208's in the cards for me today. But I have to imagine just the mentality that you have as you're getting closer and closer to the finish line of like, all right, this is happening, but I'm literally like a cramp, something really minor could easily add 10 seconds yeah. to a race of that duration. And all of a sudden you're in a very different situation. Yeah, it, it can happen so fast. And to be honest, I didn't want to be that close. I wanted to go through half marathon in 6340 to 6350 with that buffer in mind of like, hey, do you have like a really rough last mile or a patch where you're dealing with a side stitch or, or a hamstring that that's locking up on you and you have to change your stride for a few steps to get it back or what, you know, all the things that can happen. I would have loved to have 20, 30 seconds to play with. Cause that gives you, uh, just a little bit more room for error, but I mean, it worked out well in the way that it played out. And, and as I'm going through that race, I think I, after half, I kind of felt okay, I'm feeling good now. Like, let's get a few of these seconds back for me so that I do have that buffer still. So I remember pushing between 25 and 30 K like three minute, 301, three minute, 301 type K splits. And that is just giving me like another five, six seconds in that 5k. Uh, so then I probably had like a 15 second buffer at some point around 30 K. So, you know, seven miles to go, I probably had 15 seconds to play with, which is two seconds a mile. So, um, but then after that point, I didn't really have a grasp of what pace I was moving at. Cause it started getting hard, obviously. <laughs> so like, mm -hmm. I'm still checking splits and, but I, it's starting to get to that point where you're so dialed in that I'm like having a hard time processing the, the information coming to me. And I'm like, I have to kind of switch frames of mind, especially around like 35 K from trying to time trial this to like, look, I'm in a group of guys all going for this Olympic standard. If I win this group, I should make the, make the standard. And so I switched my focus from time to let's stay with this group. This group was starting to make moves. There was definitely guys like you could tell they were antsy and trying to keep it honest. So I was just more so responding to things around me and being a racer that last seven, eight K of the race. And I think that saved me because I think it could have gotten really exhausting checking your K splits because in a European race, you have that feedback 42 times on the course. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's a really, that's a really interesting point because I do remember watching uh, the, the U S trials Zach Panning did seem like he was checking his watch a fair bit from what I could tell. And that's probably a necessity when you're leading and you don't necessarily know, especially when the two guys behind you, they don't need the 208.10, you know, they just need top, you know, the top three and they're in. So like he has to be a, attentive to that to some degree. Whereas when you do find yourself in a group, that's all kind of got that same exact objective you can probably go a little more intuitive and, and, and ride the wave, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, there was one guy that broke away and, and won our group by a substantial margin. But I think I was the second finisher in the 208 10 group. Uh, so we, we had a lot of guys, I think six or seven of us finished between me and 208 10. So it was like, if we cut it pretty mm -hmm. close, but it was nice to have those guys to work with. And I think all of us were thinking the same thing. I chatted with a British guy, Eric, uh, Phil, no, I almost felt, said Phil said, yeah, Phil Sessman. I almost said Eric Sensman. Phil Sessman, yeah. <laughs> mixing my, mixing my names here. Um, but Phil Sessman from the UK, I knew him going into the race. I knew he had run 208 before high and that he was going to be going for it. And we talked a little bit before about working together. He was one of those guys I was keen off of in the last stages. And then, you know, I finished and we immediately like embraced cause we just shared that moment together. And he was actually already named to the team cause the UK selected one round early. So, um, anyways, I, was talking to him after the race and he was like, I didn't think we were going to get it. Like he was convinced we were going to come up like five seconds short with like two or three K to go. Cause you're just like kind of in that like do or die mentality and you don't know how fast you're moving through the course.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's uh, exciting stuff for us to watch, and I'm sure you're getting pretty amped to be uh, to be preparing for for the next step with the process. Um, I do want to hop in a little bit of your training, just leading into it. Uh, you're, you're coached by Ryan Hall, who um, is running a running great, as they say. Uh, so, what level of first of all, like what level of um, kind of partnership do you run with a coach like Ryan? Where is it just Hey man, you know what you're doing. I'm young. I'm fit. You tell me what to do. I'm going to do it. No question asked. Or is it a process more of like sitting down and saying, Hey, this is like what I find gives me confidence. This is what you think is going to work. Let's find kind of like a, a system that is more or less kind of fit to me based on those. How do you guys go about that kind of coaching client relationship yeah yeah it is unique with ryan because i've had a couple other coaches and one one other coach in my professional career and then my college coach being at Istone, stone coach with connor manson clayton young so i've had a few experiences in my in my life that have given me like perspective on what works for me and what doesn't and i'll tell you right now i stone was the most hands-off coach i've ever had like lets you kind of grab things by the reins he gives you the workout and you kind of interpret it however you really want to and he just kind of like all he'll really do is like hold the leash gently and maybe tell you to back off if he thinks you're getting way too out of control. But even then, like he's not like the type to really slam the brakes on you. He's going to let you kind of let you kind of push when you want to push and relax when you want to relax. So my college experience was like a very hands off coach, um, which is very unique for the NCAA. And I'm su surprised, but also not surprised at the success that it's given BYU and those guys. But Anyways, it's, it's very unique for a college programs coach to just kind of let athletes call a lot of the shots. So it's, it's really cool. And I love that. And I thought that that's kind of what I wanted my entire career. Next coach I have, Ben Rosario from NAZ Elite, is very hands-on. Like almost every detail down to the split of every quarter in a, in a workout is, is drawn out beforehand. And you're supposed to hit that exactly and your mileage is drawn out every day, double where you're going to go. Boom. Like every detail was almost like to a T when you meet where you run, <laughs> you know, like it's just, it was, it was the opposite. So it was, it was like hands completely on the wheel. And Ryan, I think is a great mix of those two. So he will tell me what he wants me to do and he'll, he'll hold me to it. But he also lets me keep my hand on the wheel and dictate some things. And one thing we've let me take full control of the last two builds and I think has been very helpful because is mileage. So uh, easy days, like if I want to recover with a 70 minute run or a 90 minute run, that's on me. I just got to be ready to work out the next time. And uh, that was something that Ryan didn't originally want to do. Give me that freedom because I think he have wanted to make sure I was recovering and getting ready for each session appropriately. But I think he learned through time and through my my pleading with him that I would make sure I was recovered and that that was my greatest fear was showing up to a workout un unprepared or 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 fried. So I ended up getting that that piece in my control and he he controls everything in the workouts. I'll sometimes suggest things that sound exciting for me and he's usually pretty receptive of that. And we'll talk at the beginning and end of every block and talk about things that we think we did well or think things we can improve on, but. I don't even know my workouts until the week of uh, of the week. I don't know what I'm going to do. And sometimes he'll ask me if I have any cravings, but for the most part, I just trust that he's going to give me the stuff I need. And every now and then I will tell him like, Hey, I really want to hit like some, some long run with like fast pace in it. And before I even get the words out of my mouth, he's like, we got that next week. So it's like, we're always like mm -hmm. in sync almost. So it's been really cool to kind of have that balance for myself. Yeah, it sounds like it's a great fit for you. And you sort of had that experience of both ends of the spectrum from a little bit more of a loose control versus a very tight control. And then, you know, being able to experience those, I'm sure you saw the the positives and potential negatives at an individual level with either of those. And, you know, finding that next piece to the puzzle for you is probably somewhere in between. Um, yeah, and I think it's, uh, I was just gonna, I'll just add, I, I think as you learn, as Ryan has learned more about me, he knows what I need more. So I almost have to have less control, but at the same time, like as I get older, I'm also knowing more what I need. It's like kind of like this weird balance of like, I have more good ideas and less bad ideas, but he also is learning me faster. So I don't know where this is going as far as 
how much control he'll have over things in the next couple of years. But I think it, it is an interesting dynamic that I do like to surrender quite a bit of control to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm sure it's a little easier sometimes knowing his pedigree with running and kind of what he's been able to do. So uh, having that trust in your coach, I think, I don't think you have to be a great runner to be a great coach necessarily. But if you can be a great runner and be coaching, it's probably not necessarily something that's going to be a, a negative for for someone like you when it comes to kind of trusting what he's got coming up for you. Ab absolutely. I When I was choosing my next coach after I left NAZ Elite, for whatever reason, I was really drawn to the idea of having my coach be someone that had been where I wanted to go. And I don't know why, but that was like almost like a, a non-negotiable when I was looking around. So Ryan was an obvious fit because of his pedigree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it kind of highlights too, I think just the balance between like, this is what it takes to run whatever time you're trying to hit on paper. Like these are the inputs that are required. But from there, you can get a lot more creative. There's different ways to to to, to do that objective. To, the inputs can be different. So I think there's also that sort of the psychological side of things where there are going to be certain workouts that maybe feed into your psyche in a way like, hey, if I can do that, my confidence in being able to kind of continue to put down those low three-minute kilometers uh, at the end stages of a 42-kilometer race that could be a huge value add. I, I had Steve Magnus on the podcast a while back and he was talking about that. He's like, there's so much that goes into just like what your your psyche and your your mindset is on the day of that allows you to maybe push through a barrier that you normally would have conceded to. And if that's what gets you to the finish line, you know, however many seconds faster, then that could be the, you know, that could be the reason for a workout, so to, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting because... I, I find this ex especially hard to accomplish with training at altitude. I don't know if uh, that makes sense, but like I can't run to a weight pace up here for very long sustained bouts. You know, like mm -hmm. I can do mile repeats at it. I can maybe do two mile reps, but I can't do the long threshold at exactly the pace that I needed to do in Seville. So I had to kind of trust that I was just fit enough and not necessarily get all that feedback and, and promise and practice. Like we tried to drop down to camp Verde for a few sessions to try to give that confidence. Like, Hey, this pace is doable. And we did a few times and had some good sessions. Uh, but I, I did drop down for one of my last big key sessions. And the goal was to kind of run to a white pace for a long threshold, but I went into it a little tired coming off of a big long run. And I couldn't, I, I did not on that day. Like I was running probably equivalent to low 209 pace and it felt really hard. And, you know, that's not sea level, we can't bear it, but it, to me, someone who's trained at altitude, it basically might as well be right. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I, I had to take confidence that the body of work was good enough and no one session told me I was ready to run 208.10. I've, that's something that I'm actually really proud of is because in the past I would have needed that feedback. I would have needed something, something to hold on to, to tell me you're ready. And this block, I really had nothing. I had nothing that I could point to that was like, that's the workout that said I'm a 208 marathoner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. That sounds like just a growth point in your career to me in terms of your ability to, kind of use the psychology to your advantage um, and kind of maybe step over something that would have previously been a hurdle for you? Absolutely. When I was in my second or third marathon builds, I remember specifically every big workout was proving ground. It was, I have to do this or else I'm not going to be able to do this on race day. Like, and I remember thinking that way and I couldn't get out of that cycle of thought. Like I'd finish a, a tough, tough session and I'd be like, how the heck am I supposed to do this for 26 miles there's no way now like and i don't find myself having those thought processes anymore now that i've done this is my eighth marathon so it's really cool i'm really proud of that more than more than the time i'm proud of the the fact that i've like lost that like insecurity with the distance and with the with the event where i can like actually just trust that i'll be ready to go and ryan is a big part of that i mean i just trust him so much so if he tells me i can do something even if i don't have the feedback it's that's enough for me mm -hmm. perfect no it sounds like you got a great fit there um and it allows you to stay in flagstaff too because you were up there prior 
and obviously having to, you don't necessarily have to move to be with a coach, I suppose, but it's uh, having them in person where you're living has to be a value add. Absolutely. I mean, Ryan's in-person coaching is the most technical hands-on in-person coaching I've ever seen. Like, it's amazing. You'll be running because so, he does the bike, right? So he's next to you the whole, yeah. whole, whole workout. And the things he's talking to you and talking you through, it's like he's in your brain and knows exactly when to say the right thing. And this is the experience of having been there, right? I'm just like, I'm blown away at like the psychological warfare that he's, he knows I'm going through by just looking at me and how to talk me through that and talk me off the ledges when I need to. And, and really like, let me lean into my tendencies. And it's just like, he's like a wizard with that stuff. And like, that's something that no workout prescription or pace or anything like that can, can quantify. It's, it's really just like knowing the athlete and knowing the experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I do want to back up a little bit away from your, your more recent success and uh, kind of reflect back on your, your college experience. I think um, I have an, maybe an interesting perspective. I, I followed the sport pretty closely um, when I was in college and then after college, uh, I was coaching track and cross country for like middle school and high school students. It was just kind of like, you know, part of the routine was following kind of what, what the pros were up to at the Olympic distances and stuff. And then I had like a dry spell from kind of the mid 2000 teens through like early 2020, where I sort of disconnected from following Olympic distance stuff for a while. So, uh, I kind of like reversed that a couple of years ago. I was like, I got to get back into this. This is just too much uh, fun. Cause a lot of, to some degree, it was some of his, like some of the, some of the kids that I saw running in high school were now starting to pop up as pros and putting up some, some pretty cool results. And I um, mean, you've, you've, I'm sure followed the sport really closely. So you, you're aware of like the, the, the trajectory of everything. The last few years, it was just too much to ignore. And um, going back and kind of just looking at the landscape, it's just insane to think like you, Connor Mance and Clayton Young are all from BYU. And now all three of you are 208 marathoners looking at uh, you know, dipping your toe into that distance at the Olympics here in, in later this year. So what was it like being on a team like that? Was there like any indication to you? Like we've got just some future rock stars here or was it sort of just like, Hey, we're just a, a really good team amongst others and we're here to compete. Like, what was that like? Well, we definitely had a very special team. I think that roster from the time I was at BYU through the time I left had a, a dozen professional caliber athletes on the roster at, at any given time. And that's just not normal. I think we were lucky. We stumbled upon good recruiting classes, good, good. Uh, like the timing was just really good. Like me and Clayton were on the BYU team for four and a half of the five years I was there. Like he came in because he served a mission. He came in to the team January of my freshman year. So I had done one semester of school and then we did four and a half semester, four and a half years straight through together. And we kind of rode the same exact waves of progression. Like, starting with just, oh, can I make the travel team? Because BYU is a very deep team to, oh, can I be making it to nationals? Can I be the best guy on the team? And we kind of had a lot of trading of places throughout those years and, and you know, a friendly rivalry of sorts. Um, but all along that, there was also other guys. There was so many guys that, that were so good that it was just like, undeniably, we thought we were really good. And we had a lot of really good moments to prove that, but it was, it was, it was very interesting. I mean, we feel like we fell short of a lot of goals in college. So it did feel like heading into our professional careers, there was a lot left on the table because we never won the team title with that group. Connor Mance ended up winning the year after Clayton and I left actually. So the 2019 year was the year BYU finally got over the hump and, and beat NAU. Um, but yeah, I just like, we knew we were good, but we also left college probably feeling like we left a lot on the table there. So I, I personally feel like I've gotten a lot better at a lot of different things post collegiately. And there's been a lot of growth uh, and it took a long time. Like it was rocky. So, and I know Clayton feels the same way. Mance, on the other hand, I mean, he's like, I don't want to, you know, put him on a different level, but like 
in high school, this guy was one of the best in the country. In college, this guy was a two-time cross. Like it's almost been like a different trajectory and different story for him. Uh, Clayton and I, I think there's more parallels to like the the ups and downs, and you know, knowing we were always talented and and hardworking athletes that had a lot of potential, but we had to kind of take our lumps and take a lot to the chin rather than kind of like being the prodigy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause I think like those different scenarios are going to be different in terms of kind of how you just view yourself as a runner and maybe how you approach it. And another thing that, you know, Steve Magnus told me that was really interesting. And obviously he's got a unique story where like he was the guy in high school and um, had all sorts of expectations set out in front of him. And he said, like, there's this, uh, there, there was this like this global expectation for him at such an early age where when he looks back at it, he's like, sometimes I wonder if I'd had more of a like a local perspective or a regional perspective at my earlier years versus having this expectation of, you know, maybe someday being one of the best at a specific distance. And what's that like? I mean, from your trajectory from you know high school to college and now professional, did you find it? challenging to embrace expectations set in front of you or do you feel like you were able to kind of keep things a little more local and regional when it was important for those growth steps to get to where you are right now yeah yeah it's funny my my high school and college career and professional career i think at each point you can point to no expectations huge jump high expectations a little valley of decline before figuring it back out you know what I mean? So uh, in high school, as a freshman and sophomore, I was not special. Like I was not like this kid that was that the coach was like ooing and eyeing over because of some sort of potential I'd shown. I worked really hard and I thought I thought I was good and thought I could be good. I hit a nice growth spurt. I was a late bloomer, ended up bursting onto the scene and eventually being a, a pretty solid high school runner, but then came back down to earth, couldn't win the state title, couldn't do this or that, you know, whatever it may be, right? I, I had a lot of goals that I'd failed to reach and same thing happened in the NCAA. When I got to BYU, I was an afterthought. I was a, basically a walk-on. I was given a book scholarship. So I wasn't a, officially a walk-on, but I was given $400 a semester towards textbooks my first year. So nobody was like mm -hmm. thinking this yeah. guy's going to be the future, you know, top guy on the team, you know, scoring points at the national meet in track. Like that was not the expectation when I came to campus, but that was the expectation I had for myself. Two years later, I'm, I, I make NCAAs. I'm already one of the best, if not the best on the BYU team. I end up getting second at NCAAs as a sophomore in the 10,000. And then I had like absolute uh, plateau failure, crumbling under pressure moments after that because it's it was new like i didn't i i almost didn't know what to do with being the man you know i kind of was an underdog for for so long that when i was when i was finally at the top i i i kind of froze under that pressure and i had a a lot of goose eggs and i've taken those lumps and took it to the professional scene and and struggled with with some things showed some promise again but then struggled again and finally i feel like I'm confident in who I am as a professional athlete and, and can kind of keep that perspective pretty inward while still looking to the, to the, to the top of the mountain and thinking, you know, I'd love to be contending with top North Americans, top athletes in the world, like thinking bigger and bigger over the long term, but also having a very like mature perspective on where I'm at and where I fit in right now. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because I think like another trend that I've started to notice that I'd be curious if I'm just reading into this too much or this is something you're seeing too is it seems like historically you'd get, you know, guys like yourself who found themselves doing quite well at the end of the day when all was said and done in Division One NCAA co competitions they would sort of go through a process of focusing on kind of track stuff, maybe some shorter road races earlier on in their career. And then they would maybe work up to the marathon. Whereas now I see guys like you, Connor and Clayton, you're sort of getting right to the marathon or, or identifying maybe like, this is probably my strength. Therefore, why not get an early start on it? Is there any thought put into that? Or is these things just kind of like, 
circumstances that are just happening more uh, um, or, or less specific, and it just happens to be that way for this particular situation. No, you can look at Connor, Clayton, and I as a direct consequence of the success of Jared Ward, right? Uh, if you know who Jared Ward is, he made the 2016 Olympic mm -hmm. team. That was my second year at BYU. So when he made that Olympic team, got sixth at the Olympics, I was an impressionable 19, 20 year old. So uh, Jared was my hero. And he went straight to the marathon after college after being a pretty good runner and then being an excellent marathoner. And I think if you don't show world class talent, on the track in college, you're probably not a world-class talent on the track, but I think there's something about the marathon that is attractive in the sense of like, you can convince yourself that with hard work and time and adaptation, you can become world-class regardless of your talent level. And we see this specifically, I've become really uh, recently interested in Japanese marathoning and they all, yeah perform at a very world-class level without world-class track times and without any proof that they should be contending in majors or running 205 or 206, whatever it may be. So there's something about the marathon that gave me like that dreamers punchers chance at my all-time goals, which is the pinnacle of the sport, which we're talking about, which is why we're talking here is the Olympics, right? So here I am hopefully preparing for my first Olympic games as a 27 year old marathoner with eight marathons under my belt, four years of experience now at this point. And I look at it as like, I've reached the barrier of entry for the top of, of, of the world, right? The Olympics, the biggest race every four years. And this is step one to hopefully a multi-step plan to be a hopeful metal contender at one point in my life. Like I, I have to, I have to give myself that op, that opportunity and that, that open-mindedness to have like what could happen four years from now in LA or eight years now in, I think it's Brisbane. <laughs> it's supposed to be the 2032 games. So I don't, I don't know. Like I'm just trying to have a very process oriented approach. And Jared, Jared is the reason why he, he got sixth at the Olympics in 2016. And, and that, inspired a dream in me that I could one day do that or better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting how that kind of set the precedent. And that was for all three of you guys had that sort of experience? Or is that more unique to you? I could only speak for myself, but they did the same thing. So and I think Coach Eyestone also, he lets people think about the marathon a lot earlier than most coaches. There's like North Americans are are weird about it. Like you look at Africans yeah. and Japanese runners, they go straight to the marathon. Like a Japanese runner that's 21 years old, whatever, just ran 206 in Osaka. Um, you, you hear about all these Ethiopians and Kenyans running world-class times in their early 20s. We have, we think we have to be tapped out and just like a, a, a rag just wrung out with every potential we have on the track before you even think about the marathon. And to me, that's just backwards. If you think the marathon is going to be your best event, why not take your lumps in your 20s so that you're when you hit your peak in your late 20s and 30s you're actually an experienced veteran in the in the event yeah no doubt it is interesting cuz it's like you said the NCAA's doesn't really have a ideal predictor of who's going to be the best marathoners i mean i think you could it probably stands to reason the best in the 10k probably have a good shot at becoming a, a great marathoner but you don't have to be great in the 10 K to be a good marathon or a great marathoner either. So yeah, that's yeah, just one of those things where if you, yeah, like you said, if you're not, if you don't, if you don't see that trajectory in the the track distances, maybe it is better for you just to get a head start and go right in. Yeah. And I, I, I try to convince everybody to run the marathon and I try to tell them, even if they're track people, like you can run a fall marathon and then be ready for indoors. Like that's a real possibility, but they, they think that they're losing out on speed or something. It's like, I don't believe that I've run my, I ran a sub four mile in my build towards Seville. I ran a uh, track personal bests in 2022 in the three K and five K and I'm going to try to run a 10 K personal best this spring. I don't think the marathon stops you from developing on the track. It, it may change the way you have to approach it and what you emphasize in certain parts of the year, but I still think I could run my best 5k 
if I decided to focus on it this spring. Like I, I believe wholeheartedly I could run a personal best this spring in the 5K if I wanted to. Hey folks, just a quick reminder that this podcast sponsors include S Fuels. S Fuels is offering a free 30 serving pack of their train product, but there are only 50 available, so hurry up. Head over to sfuelsgolonger.com, add the train product to your cart, enter promo code HPO train to get it for free and free shipping. Element Electrolytes, they have a free sample pack offer for you. John G Apparel has a 10% offer for you. And Delta G Ketones has a 20% off and free consultation offer for you. Links and details can be found in the show notes and the episode landing page. You can also check out a full description of how I use all of these products in my own training and racing at the end of this podcast episode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Speaking of that, is uh, as much as you can share, is there any like race schedule you're trying to employ between now and the Olympics that includes some shorter distance stuff as just kind of the route to, or is that something that is uh, um, hard to kind of fit in at this point in time? Absolutely. So I have like a mini racing season that I'm, I've laid out and I kind of had it picked like within 48 hours <laughs> of running Seville, which is just, that's my personality. Like I was laying in bed the night of the marathon. So like ran the marathon that morning, couldn't sleep the night after. Cause I was just buzzing with excitement. Yeah. And so I just grabbed my phone and start looking up things and trying to figure out a race schedule and planning it. And I'm texting Ryan, it's eight hours earlier here in Flagstaff. It's like probably 2 PM here, 3 PM here. And it's 11, 11 o'clock at night in Spain. And I'm just like, Hey, I can't sleep. So I'm looking at races. What do you think about this? What do you think about this? <laughs> and, uh, we pretty much nailed down a plan within 48 hours. And that's going to include, uh, I, I think I can share all this. I, I, it's not that secret. So uh, a half marathon in Gifu, Japan in the end of April, uh, and then two 10 Ks in May, uh, one track, one road, both Canadian championships, one in Vancouver, BC, one in Ottawa. So I've done Ottawa the last two years. It's one of my favorite races. I'm excited to go back there. And one thing that I'm really upset about is I've never won a national championship. <laughs> I've been second a bunch. I've been third a bunch. So I, that's like kind of the primary spring goal is like between those two 10 Ks in May, please just win one national championship, hopefully two, but <laughs> I got to, I got to get that monkey off my back. Cause that feels like a, a blemish on my record that I don't like. Yeah. And a nice little confidence boost heading into the Olympics too. I'm sure if that, if that happens. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully run some fast 10 Ks too. Not just, not just win it win a championship, but hopefully lay down some, some times that I think I'm capable of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, how long have you been with Puma? I signed on with Puma May of 2022. So it's coming up on the two year, okay. two year anniversary here. So they've been awesome to work with. Yeah. Do you, do you, uh, talk much with Todd Folker by any chance? I know that name. He's, he, he's in product design, right? Yeah. Yeah. I've yeah. Met, the, the reason, the reason I've I asked met him, I think oh, go ahead, twice. Go ahead. I, I, I think I met him at TRE this year for the first time, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, cool. Yeah. I asked cause Todd actually, I I've known him for a long time cause he used to, uh, he worked for the actual parent company of ultra footwear. So he was helping design some of their models earlier on. Uh, so he's had a lot of input into like the shoes that I've been wearing and stuff. So like I've been, I stayed in touch with him now that he's at at Puma and you know he's such a shoe nerd um I wanted to ask you like so he shares all sorts of stuff with me about just uh, not anything like secret that he shouldn't be but like just like when things are kind of like already coming out he's like hey man this is kind of a cool new design thing I'm looking at um so I'm familiar with Puma's lineup uh because of that so I was kind of curious like what shoe you're racing in these days for the marathon yeah so I did uh, actually a running economy test in the Puma lab in, in Boston, right before I went to Seville comparing the deviate elite three, which is their newest shoe. The one that Fiona O'Keefe mm -hmm. and Dakota Lindworm wore at the U S Olympic trials. And then the fast R two one that just hit the, the market, I think last week. And mm -hmm. there's like two differing opinions on which shoe you should be in based on your stride but i wanted to confirm it in the lab and i i'd been racing in the fast r2 but i started training in the deviate threes uh during my build and kind of had like this impression like hey 
both these are good. I can tell I could run a great marathon in either shoe, but let's just take it to the lab and see what works best. And we found that I was slightly more efficient in the fast R2, which was my, what I thought would happen. So I had raced Houston in that I raced Seville in that. Uh, so I, I've, I've kind of narrowed it down. Like that's, that's a shoe that fits my stride quite well. And that's the one with the kind of, uh, similar to the alpha fly that the two separate planes where the heel and the toe have like a exposed plate and it's separate playing fields kind of, and, and it's, it's got this like yeah. nasty looking, like awesome toe off where the extended toe plate and like just things that like, when you first look at it, you're like, wow, this shoe's different. Like it looks different. So it's, it's really been great, mm -hmm. great for my stride. So. Yeah. I was curious to get your input on that. Cause I did, I was paying attention to that at the, at the trials. And I did notice that, uh, the Puma athletes, uh, on the women's side had, were wearing the deviate. And I was curious if that was something that was specific to their gait or if that was a trend that was happening with, um, more of the Puma athletes, but it, it sounds like you all are getting in the lab and figuring it out before you take the it to the streets. The thing I've noticed is it, it seems almost like a male female thing. And I, I don't know if Puma wants it to be that mm. way, but like the females that have been doing really well, the women <laughs> that have been doing really well are, uh, are wearing the DVA threes. But if you look at Pat Tiernan who ran 207, 40 something in Houston, he wore the fast R twos, Hendrik Pfeiffer ran 207, 15 German guy in Houston, fast R twos. Sandra Moen ran 207 in Fukuoka, fast R2s. I ran 208 in Seville, fast R2s. So th there just seems to be a trend that the men that are excelling in the marathon are wearing the fast R2s and the women excelling in the marathon have, have recently gone deviate. And I think that that's because in order to get everything out of the fast R2, I think you got to put a lot of force into those, those plates. And so it helps to be a bit heavier. And if you look at Pat, Pat mm. Tiernan's a big dude, I'm, I'm bigger than most marathoners. I think that that, that's something that I've noticed. I don't know if there's any positive research other than just anecdotal stuff uh, that would suggest that, but I, that's a trend I've noticed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's just like a kind of in the broader conversation around super shoes. It is like we sort of have teased out that in most cases, it's going to be an advantage to have that type of shoe on or that type of foam, I guess, and then the carbon plate uh, versus the control shoe. But from there, you know, it can range as to which one actually works better. So it kind of adds an, a layer of complexity for someone like yourself when you're preparing for these things to kind of like, okay, I have to do all the things in training that I know are going to get me where I'm going to be. But I also have to make sure the pair of shoes I choose to wear on race day are going to be the ones that, you know, give me the, the highest rate of efficiency. Yeah. And I did that test, but the one thing about the marathon that you can't test in the lab is what does your stride do at 35, 40 K 24 to 26. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, <laughs> I just had to trust that, you know, I, I'd done enough in the shoe and that I, that the shoe was going to work for me and that I felt confident in it. And, uh, yeah, I, I got to that point with the fast art too, where I was like, okay, I feel really good about this shoe. Um, I trust it. So that's, that's as, and, and with super shoes, you know, amongst, pros we know that there's different responses for different types of strides and different athletes so uh there's super responders there's people that i think would be good if they wore a pair of crocs just because they're so fit they're <laughs> so efficient as is so uh it is an interesting world we live in where shoes can be a piece of the puzzle more so than they ever were Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you're, when you're setting up your training, are you pretty strategic on when you pull out a pair of fast stars? Cause that is a different enough shoe where I would imagine it's not something you're going to be throwing on every day. Yeah. Yeah, I, I am. And Ryan is too. Ryan would fight me tooth and nail of, of to, to wear them less. I tried to not ask him what I should wear. Cause he'll almost always default to not wearing super shoes. So <laughs> I try to like, not say anything to him and just show up with just the super shoes if I want to wear those. But generally he'll tell me like no super shoes today, if he wants it to be like a all trainer day or whatnot. And, mm -hmm. you know, he's reasonable with it. I know some coaches that are like super intense or don't, don't have to give it any thought, but he, he gives it some thought. And basically when we're trying to run specific marathon pace stuff where it's like, Hey, this is like race simulation, like throw on the race shoes, but anything else, let's, mm -hmm. let's try to, let's try to callous the legs and not give ourselves this, this bandaid that might be doling at it might be doling like the lower leg toughness that we're trying to build for the marathon. Cause I do think 
at some point we we can overuse a tool, right? So uh, for me, I think I I benefit a lot from the super shoes. So I need to be careful not to weaken my legs by overusing them. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting conversation because like you sort of outlined there, there is the the value add of let's say, okay, I'm going to do all my training in this super shoe. You're probably going to run more miles. And then is that trade off worth whatever like atrophying you may get of your lower leg muscles had you worn something a little more uh, less forgiving, I should say. And yeah, I mean, there's probably a balance there, right? It's probably not yeah. like all or nothing. It's <laughs> yeah, I, I look at like what other people are doing. And I'm always curious, like if we can get in our own head about this, because, you know, you see on Instagram, the clips of 40 Kenyans out on Moy Ben Road and whatever, every one of them is wearing a super shoe in their long run. And I'm like, wait, like it makes long runs so much easier to wear super shoes. And Ryan's like pretty much like trainers in every long run. And I'm like, ah, but like I could run five seconds per mile faster and feel 20% easier if you just let me wear the super shoes the whole time. But we don't, I only put on the super shoes when I'm running the pace of a marathon basically. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough balance to strike. And I, I don't know if I'm doing it perfect, but I, I'm confident that Ryan's giving it critical thought and has his, his theories on how to use them. And you just got to trust him on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I want to pivot away from uh, one kind of logistical thing to another here uh, and ask you a little bit about kind of your marathon race uh, nutrition, like what you guys are doing. Um, I've been sort of following some of the gut training kind of hyper fueling strategies some of the cyclists have been doing in the Tour de France athletes and they're starting to kind of push some pretty insanely high numbers of carbohydrate intake during during their, their, uh, their racing and in some cases training. Are you guys pushing that in the marathon at – at your level two, trying to get up like a lot higher than maybe would have been done historically. I feel like I'm getting better and better at fueling for the marathon and learning this. And this is something that obviously a lot of marathoners in general, I think are undervaluing. And for me specifically, I just practice it a lot. I don't, I'm not super scientific with it unfortunately, which maybe I should be more. And I would say that smarter people than I would tell me to be a little bit more scientific, but I basically just try to consume as much as possible as frequently as possible and see what happens. But I do have a very strong gut. It has been proven in training that I can handle a lot. So I do try to do a lot and try to push those lines so that I can see what I can, I'm capable of. And for example, I can't remember the exact number. I'm going to butcher this, but I think I had 240 grams of carbohydrates on course as possibly to consume throughout the race. And I don't think I consumed all of that, but I consumed probably 75 to 80% of that throughout the race. And that is on the higher end. I was probably at least 80 grams per hour, maybe pushing closer to 90 um, or 100. But I don't I'm not that scientific to the point where I know exactly how much I took in. I, t I had four mm -hmm. gels in the race, in the race where I did all that. And those each have 30. And then I was sipping carbohydrate drink, every bottle that I got. Uh, and I don't know how much I consumed of each of those. So <laughs> I just was sipping it and then mm -hmm. tossing it. So, but it, it is something that I think I can improve upon going forward. And it means more, as the conditions worsen, I think. And I cycling is like one of those sports that like, I think running should take some things from, but I also think it's dangerous to take too much from because it is different mm -hmm. enough. Like I think the, 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 the pounding, the oscillation like does different things to the gut than just sitting on a bike. Like, I don't know, like running just shakes you up. So it's, it is, you're, you're playing mm -hmm. with fire there, especially at those speeds. I feel like you're, you're burning pretty hot. Uh, if you're running three minute K's. So, um, I've nailed the, the fueling my last two marathons and felt really good about it. So I'm just going to keep doing what I've been doing and push the envelope in training and see what happens. But I think I've kind of reached optimal fueling strategy, I guess. And, and the only thing that can be tweaked is maybe, you know, for example, if Paris is super hot, like what do I do with my sodium intake? What do I do with, you know, 
fluids in versus the sweat rate and that kind of stuff. You can get little, little sciencey about that stuff. And I've done that before, like for Budapest, I was pretty specific about getting enough fluids back in knowing that I was going to sweat a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's all interesting stuff. I would, I would agree with you for the fueling side of things. It sounds like, you know, you're, you're, you're putting out on course, what I would imagine is like the most you would ever really need to entertain. And then by getting 70 to 80 percent of that in you're likely hitting it hitting it clean enough i mean like yeah cycling you're always gonna be able to do more like you said less jostling the the research i've seen too it's like it's unconvincing to me that like going like up to like 120 plus is going to really give you a huge value add day of there may be some some recovery benefits from doing that but if you're not doing a stage race you know you're you're probably not too concerned when you finish a marathon in 208 about whether you recover 12 hours earlier or not at that point, unless you're CJ Albertson, <laughs> well, you're looking to get back on the course a week it's, later. It's interesting you say that though, because I did fuel the best, I think this most recent one, and I felt pretty dang good 48 hours later. So like, okay, maybe that's part of it. And that's something I didn't even consider, like how it would help me recover. But I had a lot mm -hmm. of fuel on course. And as far as like my legs go, I was like fine two days later. Like I felt like I could have done a, a threshold session on Wednesday after it. You know what I mean? Like it was it was a yeah. weird feeling to be like, my legs are like good right now. So the course is flat. It's and I paced it well, it didn't bonk. Like there's other factors at play there, but but I am curious mm -hmm. what factor having done more carbs in the race than ever played in that. So I know I had more carbs than I've ever consumed in a race because I was I was able to just hold everything in and, and, and just drain gels and drink a lot of fluid. So I, I know I was high this race and, and I did come out of it feeling pretty good. So maybe there is something to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like you said, though, it's, it's one of those things where you've set a precedent for yourself with some solid races with a, a specific strategy. So at that point, it's kind of like, you don't, you also want to be careful not messing with something that's working and uh you know keep rolling it out there as long as it keeps responding yeah yeah there's there's things I've, i haven't tried that like ryan might want me to try that he's curious in like i've been kind of hesitant on trying ketones i've i've dabbled but like that's something that is entering our space and i'm not sure whether or not mm -hmm. i should like there's obviously like there's a risk with how it affects your gut and you know but there's also the, the potential benefit of adding another fuel source in the race that I, that Ryan wants me to try and that I've, I've dabbled with in training, but haven't had the courage to throw in my bottles for race day yet. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we'll see, that might be something I, I mess around with in this build to Paris and maybe I can get confident enough in it that I can add that. I don't know what you know about that. It seems like you're kind of like more of an expert on the fueling side, just being an ultra guy and, and being in this space and being a student of the sport. Yeah, you know, it's definitely something I've gotten curious on. I actually had one of the leading researchers on exogenous ketones on the podcast a couple episodes back. And it's really pretty interesting stuff. Like the research isn't necessarily like conclusive in one way or the other. There's like promising studies that'll say just about everything. And there's ones that'll say like, you know, it's going to tank your performance. So <laughs> it is a little bit of a uh, of a of an unknown in a lot of cases, like like most things that are kind of early in their uh, in their their process, I, yeah. I suspect we're going to learn some things that we can kind of safely say, this is what, th this is the application for this. And this is how you go about it. Um, for you, I would be, if I had to guess, um, and, and take this with a grain of salt, but like, I would guess that like exogenous ketones for something you're at the intensity you're doing, I would maybe shy away from doing that intra competition. Um, and, but, maybe lean into that a little more as like a recovery tool. So some of there's kind of two sides to this, this research. One is like the actual performance of taking it during your competition or during your workout. And then there's the, the, the protocol to say like, all right, take us some exogenous ketones after your big training session. And then maybe again, that night before you go to bed as a way to speed up recovery, where I think that second one maybe has a little more promise than the former one for something that like what you're doing. Yeah. So yeah, I've heard that um, as well. Yeah. So I'm, I, yeah, I need, I need to play with it. Cause obviously like at this level, 
percentage points matter. So if we can find it, yeah. if we can find mm -hmm. it in something like that, it's a pretty easy way to, to improve recovery and improve performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's just part of the process nowadays where, yeah, like you said, you've turned over all the big stones, like you've done, the, you've optimized the training, you've optimized the, the sleep, the recovery and all that, the nutrition, I'm sure, and all that stuff is all things that you've been thinking about probably since college. And now it's like, what can you do to grab that extra half percent, one percent in efficiency or recovery that kind of takes you to that next the next spot? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I wanted to follow up real quick on your hydration strategy too, because this is another thing I've been geeking out on a little bit more the last couple of years is things like, you know, sweat loss rate and then like sodium replacement and things like that. Have you, have you done like a test where, you know, like, I mean, I guess sodium loss is maybe not as big of a concern for you in the marathon, but it could be if it's hot enough, how much of that have you looked at? So early in my marathon career, I had a, I had a really, really rough experience at Boston 2021, the year it was in the fall. And after that, I kind of like tore everything down and asked a lot of questions about like what I was doing wrong. And one of the things mm -hmm. that we had a theory on was that I was under fueling and uh, not replacing. It was a humid day that day and I, you know, maybe just not replacing enough fluids. Uh, so I, I worked with Trent Stellingworth, who's a Canadian, uh, yeah. you know, what what is he exercise physiologist i don't i don't know his title but he's smart a smart guy <laughs> so uh yeah. he's really like dialed into all this stuff and he had me go through a prot protocol where um i would weigh myself before and after sessions weigh my bottles just see how much i was losing as far as fluids in certain conditions you know know what the conditions were out there and and kind of play with that and i did that for a build and i think it just taught me that I needed to fuel a little bit more, take a little bit more fluids in like a very simple application. And then I stopped being scientific about it and just saying, okay, take one more sip every time, take one big yeah. sip every time or something, you know? Um, it, yeah. I, I like to try to simplify things and take a little less thought into those things. So I'm not the kind of guy that's going to like mark a line on my bottle, fill up to that line no, and say, you have to finish this bottle every time you get it. It's more like, uh, am I doing 80% of what I need to do every time? Like just like getting just the baseline right and, and hoping that I'm eliminating risk factors. So yeah, I, I, I will mm -hmm. probably play with it a bit more this summer with the fact that the Olympics and world championship races are always hot. So it's definitely not going to be cool temps in Paris. So I think we can count on at least humidity and like mildly warm conditions. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll probably play with it again and try to try to just see what I need to take in and, and just try to be really on top of it there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it sounds like you're going about it in a way that I would imagine is productive. It's like you're doing you're looking into it. So you're you know what you need. And then once you know that it's like, do you really want to have the cognitive load of stressing about like an ounce here, an ounce there when you're out there trying to dedicate all your cognitive abilities to focusing on hitting those splits. And it's like, to a certain point, it needs to become intuitive so that you can unload that cognitive yeah. burden of having to think about it. It sounds like that's where you're yeah, at. Yeah, and I think some runners, they're like very type A, like, I don't know what the right word is, you know, obsessive over these things, right? Mm -hmm. I think of myself more a little bit like I, I think about a lot of these things, but I want to kind of be a dumb jock out there like when I'm racing and just <laughs> like, like, not worry about that stuff. So if I can assess the problem outside of races, and then just be as stupid as possible on the race day, and like, just turn all my focus on just being a competitor and being a, a, my fiery self, I think that's where I get get the most out of myself. So I, I, I run pretty, pretty hot when it comes to like, my thought process during a race. So I kind of have to eliminate variables that can take away from the racing itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting stuff. Um, I did want to jump into, uh, some stuff around just like kind of your perspective that you have with, uh, preparing for the Olympics versus what you've done in the past. So like you ran at the world marathon championships last year, 
um, and did quite well. I think you were 19th, right? 18th after one of the guys in front of me got uh, popped for doping. So I'll count myself as 18th. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's right. You can only move up from yeah, here. That's yeah. Right. So <laughs> one of those situations. It, it actually, on World Athletics um, now, it says I was 18th. So they took him out of the results. So whatever. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, we'll see. Give it a few more years. Maybe you'll move up a couple more spots. <laughs> it's likely, unfortunate. <laughs> um yeah so i mean generally speaking i would imagine like in terms of like having experiences that you can lean on that are going to be something you can say like okay this isn't all brand new to me when you start going through the process of traveling to paris and then ultimately getting ready for for the event itself um were there any takeaways from the world championships where you were just like okay this is something i need to do differently because of this scenario that you maybe wouldn't have known had you not done that yeah uh i am like so so glad i did budapest last year and eugene the year before specifically budapest though because it was a european one and the olympics are in europe as well so i'm going to do a lot of things very similarly as far as like timing i go over there um you know heat heat adaptation processes all those things because those are part of it um i think where I lack in top end time talent, you know, I'm not a 203 guy, not a 202 guy, whatever, which I will be racing a handful of those, obviously at the Olympic games, I can gain on heat prep, you know, timing of like getting over there, being, making sure my body's on the right time zone, you know, all the things that like are real when you're talking about traveling across the world and competing, I've kind of check those boxes as like as far as an experience goes uh so i'm going to be going to europe two weeks before same as i did to budapest i'll spend the first week in barcelona same thing i did for budapest get some heat adaptation in a very hot climate go to paris a week before you know running a course a little bit do this and that and then also uh just kind of knowing how global championships play out differently than say seville seville's a time trial uh the global championship races, you have no idea what's going to happen when the gun goes off. Somebody can make it fast right from the gun. It can be a, a blitz or people can really dilly dally until later in the race. And I think with Paris being a difficult course and the conditions possibly being brutal, there might be a lot of, of measuring early in the race. Um, and it, it could play, play out in a way that benefits people that are really smart and how they, how they fuel, how they pace, how they how they manage the hills and prepare for the hills. So I'm I'm looking to gain a lot of small edges with my experience in the previous World Championships and also um, the details with course prep and condition prep. Mm -hmm. Are you doing like a sauna protocol to prepare for the heat, or are you getting all the the chicken coop lights lined up in front of your treadmill like CJ? So I actually have chickens, <laughs> but I don't even have the chicken coop lights. So uh, I, I've got one piece of that, but no, I won't do I won't do that. What I did last summer was I just did all my easy running in black long sleeves, black tights, and here in Flagstaff, it's it's warm as soon as the sun comes up. It's not like hot. It's not a scorcher, but the sun's strong. If you're wearing dark clothing, covering your skin, like trapping heat in, wearing a, you know, a windproof jacket that just kind of creates a sauna suit. And I did some stuff with like core temp, like the, the brand core, like where you wear the, the thing and it measures your core temp. And I got it super high in the summer last year training. And I got really comfortable with that. It was like crazy how quickly I adapted to wearing like basically sweatsuits in 80 degree temperature runs at 7,000 feet in the baking sun, you know, like I was doing things that I was like, Oh, this is like normal for me now. Like I'm not even, it's like not even a thing. And then I go to Barcelona where it's 95 degrees Fahrenheit, 80% humidity baking in the sun. And, and I'm like comfortable out there. And I got really confident the week of Budapest because it was so hot there. And I was like, not noticing the heat anymore. I got to the point where like it was comfortable. And in the race, I did all the mm. heat measures. You know, I, I had ice packs on all my bottles. I, you know, the chemical ones, I'd break it. I'd hold it. I, I'd cool my core temp through my palm. I would, you know, squeeze the sponge over my head, whatever it was. I was doing all the things I could to counteract the heat, but I never once thought about the heat while I was racing. I was doing the things, but I felt comfortable in the heat. And I, 
I take a lot of confidence in, in that specifically. So I hope Paris is just hot, muggy, hilly, nasty day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you have a goal for Paris that you're trying to target from a position standpoint? Yeah, I think um, having been top 20 in the last two world championships, both were deep years, talented years. I think with the, the Olympics being notorious for uh, having a lot of anticipation and build, like I think a lot of people shoot themselves in the foot in the lead up and in the race itself, you know, going for medals and going for broke and glory and all that stuff. I think I will deploy a plan that gives me a chance at top 10. And that would be like a really cool stepping stone, I think in this first experience to, to build upon for four years from now. So that's, that's kind of what I'm setting my set on. And obviously I can't control if 10 guys are better than me on the day. Uh, there's certainly going to be 10 guys more talented than me on the day, but um, I'm going to give myself a chance at that and, and plan as if that's the goal. And hopefully I can, hopefully I can exceed that goal. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. And it's like you said, there is uh, there's guys that will be in that field that are 202 marathoners. Um, there's going to be guys a minute or two behind them on paper who are thinking to themselves, you know, it's I'm going for a medal or bust. And some of those guys will blow up. A lot of so them. it's yeah. like, it's yeah, yeah. So if you run your race, you know, that's one of those things where it's like, on paper, the guys may be four or five minutes faster than you, but at the race itself, maybe not. Yeah, yeah. and in Budapest, I beat a lot of 205, 206 guys. And the way I see it is, I'd love to be in a position where fitness-wise, I make another jump from here to the to the games, maybe a, maybe a minute better, maybe two minutes better fitness-wise. Who knows? And then I can beat people that are maybe two minutes, three minutes better than me on paper. So if I can, if I can start to like eke myself into the world where I'm competing with the 204 guys in the race, that's when you can like, there's not going to be 10 more than 10, 204 or better guys. So um, that's, that's mm -hmm. the way I kind of frame it is like, they're going to be going for something a lot bigger than I will be. And I'm not saying like, I'm ruling out the opportunity to medal. who knows you never know what the race will, will, will play out like, but I'm not going to go out there with on the start line thinking metal or bust. Like if the race gets out of hand and I know I can't run, you know, whatever they're doing for, for 42 K I'm going to check off. Like, I'm not going to be like, stay with them for the metal, you know? So it's, I'm going to run, mm -hmm. I'm going to yeah. run my own race and that's going to be of a benefit in finishing place. No doubt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like you said, you just never know. I think we saw that at the last Olympics with Molly, where it's like, no one was guessing she was going to come away with a medal there. And she just came, came away with a medal. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> that's inspiring. I know Molly well as a Puma athlete and as a fellow Flagstaff runner. So, yeah, I mean, I would love, I'll chat with her whenever I can get the chance to kind of talk about how her approach was. Cause I, I do think that it's not crazy to think that someone who's on the line and fit and ready to go could, could have that day. If, if the cards, you know, line up in their favor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, you're, you're in Flagstaff. Uh, there's a lot of pros in Flagstaff these days. Do you all hang out quite a bit or train together? Or is it more compartmentalized than that? We all imagine you're out there just doing these big 20 person group workouts. <laughs> That's not the case for me. Uh, it is the case for some of the groups. Um, I train with a few of my training partners. I, uh, I have friends that I'll do easy runs with, but I actually like to work out like alone a lot. So um, this last build, I actually was the first build under Ryan where I probably had a workout partner. 90% of the time because Bia Simbasa was training for the U S Olympic trials. And so our, our workouts lined up like perfectly, but, um, no, I don't, I don't link up with too many people outside of my group. Uh, I'm friends with all those people. If I see them, I'm not like, I don't look the other way. I'll, I'll, glad, right, I'll yeah. gladly share some miles with them. But like if I show up to Lake Mary road and it's 8 a.m. and there's two other groups there that are starting their workout at the same time. I'm not like, hey, what do you have? Like, maybe we can mix in. Like, it's usually like, I got my workout, you got yours. Have a good one out there. Maybe we'll warm up together. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and it's specific enough probably in most cases where you're you're making a compromise if you're doing too much of that. And then um, it kind of leads into my next question too is like you also have other things you're building this stuff around too. Like you're a husband, a father of two. Um, there's a lot going on in your life outside of just the the training and racing and you have to make all that fit as well. Absolutely. I think I've, I, uh, the way I frame it is I've chosen to live a life that's a lot harder than, than most professional runners. It's very rewarding and it gives me a lot of purpose. And I think it, it has made me a better athlete unintentionally, but there's no doubt there's way more challenge when you have to get home to help take care of children and, and, you know, the highs and lows of having a toddler are, are very frequent and intense. Um, <laughs> so I think it's, it's, it's definitely different. I have a lot of friends that are just bachelors and I'm every now and then I'm, I look over and I'm like, yeah, that, that sounds nice. You can kind of just do whatever you want. But I, I, at the end of yeah. the day, I'm really grateful for the situation I'm in as it's, it's definitely, I've improved as an athlete substantially since the birth of my first kid. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I think it's given me a lot of purpose and it's given me uh, a great way to kind of compartmentalize, which I think great athletes and great performers need to do. Um, there's a lot of like hype culture around obsessing over your craft and David Goggins, this, you know, st you know, but in reality, I benefit from going home and being a dad and then going up when, when I run, it's my escape. You know, it's, it's my, it's my time. It's, it's the selfish hours in the day. And it's, it's helped me not be too obsessive about my craft, which I could have easily been in my younger years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's an interesting topic. I mean, I think there's a balance there. I think there's like, you can get too relaxed in terms of what you have that you're essentially responsible for outside of the running. So to the degree where I think sometimes like if you just incubate yourself to the degree where all you're doing is doing that workout and then just relaxing and recovering for the next session and you know, the quality of your training session is going to make or break your day, that, that doesn't necessarily play out well either in your psyche. So I think obviously you want to have enough control where you're not losing too much sleep or like missing key training components. But at the end of the day, I think it's good to have outlets and those outlets uh, can sometimes add a little bit of stress at times, but they don't necessarily have to be to the degree that it does anything other than make you maybe a little more resilient. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I brought my kids to Spain with me and when we arrived, the first day was hard and I thought, Oh, I made a great mistake here. Like this is going to, this is going to backfire <laughs> big time. And then by the time the race played out, I was so happy that they were there and it was pretty magical to finish that moment and then have them at the finish line ready to celebrate. Cause it would have been a little, little sad to have that moment, that big of a moment, one that, you know, quite honestly will change my life in some ways. Like some things will remain the same, but I think I've done something that will forever change who I am. And, uh, having the people that are the most impactful on that journey be there for the finish and be there for the post-race celebrations and the pre-race emotions uh, was, was very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I recently had Hayden Hawks on the show and he's, um, he's a very, very international competitive ultra runner with a family and he'll bring his family with him on some of the international races and things like that. And it's uh it's one of those things where your your kids are probably too young at this point to really take away a big message from this. But eventually they'll be old enough if you bring them with you. Like they're getting like some great life experiences, checking out new places, other cultures, different countries and things like that to the degree where I'm sure they will, you know, when they remember their childhood, that stuff is going to be something they that cements in their head as like a big value add from an experience standpoint. Yeah, yeah. I, I After that Spain trip, my wife and I, uh, talked about how do we do this more often and, and in different ways and and what is the the ceiling on like what 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 opportunities could be because of what I do and the nature of it and I have some cool ideas that I'm I'm cooking up that hopefully give my kids that experience like like you're talking about and obviously my son he'll be three this year so a lot of the things I'm doing now might not cement into his into his psyche but maybe in a couple of years it, it'll be pretty formative yeah no doubt um 
This has been awesome, Rory. Uh, it's always fun to chat with someone like yourself who is, uh, you know, tr trending up in in sport and in life, and having the willingness to kind of share some of your experience and things like that. I know you've uh, more recently started kind of making some more YouTube content, things like that. Is there going to be like a series that? highlights your build to the Olympics? Absolutely. I loved doing long form content for the first time ever with the YouTube. I've received a lot of positive praise, uh, especially after Seville. People loved that vlog with that trip. And I was really proud of it. I think it, it'll be like something I, like you're talking about my kids, like they may not remember the trip, but now there's this like timestamp proof of what happened out there. And you know, in a couple of years, they can watch that and, and it can hopefully, you know, be a special memory for all of us. So I'm going to keep doing it. Uh, I'm hoping to bring on like some sort of way to offset the cost, but I will invest in myself and hopefully that that figures itself out later because it does cost a lot of money because I pay someone else to produce all the content. So uh, sure. yeah, I'm trying to bring sponsors on and, and increase my sub count and get some revenue in there. I just became monetized. So it's you know, this is like just details, but, uh, it, it, I will mm -hmm. do it is, is, is what I'm trying to say, but I'm hoping to make it a little bit easier on myself. Cause there was an upfront cost this bit go around. Cause I was a new concept. So hopefully with the proof of concept, I can do it even better and, and more frequently going forward. Yeah. I mean, I think you're thinking along the right lines. It's one of those things where if I look back at kind of the onset of my running career, and what I did along the way that kind of keeps me in it to some degree, it is a lot of the content stuff. So it's like, you know, when I first started ultra running, it was like you, you raced well or you didn't get a contract. That was really all there was to it. It's like there's magazine articles and things like that. And you tended to have to be racing well in order to get a lot of access to that. Whereas now it's like, you know, you can have a podcast, a YouTube channel, social media, stuff like that. These are all value adds to your sponsors and things like that. Yeah. So there's definitely a payoff for you at the end of that if you keep kind of putting that content out yeah, there. Yeah, and that's I'm I consider running to be my career, not just my passion. It is my passion, but it is my career as well. And I'm constantly thinking about ways to add value to myself, to put myself in a position of leverage and give myself more time in this sport and regardless of performance, I want to be bringing great value back to my sponsors. And also I, I enjoy it. I enjoy sharing. I think it's cool to connect with others through, you know, different platforms and YouTube was the scariest one to do, but also the most rewarding so far. So I'm very excited to continue that journey. Yeah. Yeah. You do run the risk of someone telling you, like, if you had done this differently, you would run one second per mile faster or something like that. But... Yeah. Pe people <laughs> love in today's culture also like to call you an influencer, like degrade you because you're not because <laughs> you're not putting every ounce of your being into your craft but i know this about myself that that actually doesn't translate to more success if i was you know living like a monk where all i did was train and 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 meditate i don't think i would be a better athlete by any means so yeah, I like once a runner as much as the next guy does. But yeah, you don't necessarily need to lock yourself in a cabin and, and do nothing but training. There's plenty of other outlets. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's, that's what I've learned about myself. And I'll, I'm sure I'll have more and more haters and detractors because I'm putting out more stuff. But hey, I know that people are liking it too. So I, I don't I try to cut out that noise and just enjoy the process. No doubt. No, most people are loving it, myself included. So uh, we appreciate you sharing the journey. It's always fun to to have that stuff and be able to follow along. I mean, to some degree, the people who actually care and that um, are meaningful like, inputs too are just more invested in your result then because they have a storyline that they've been following. They see what you're doing. And then when you go out and have a good result, they're more they're more attached to it. They feel like it was part part of something that they were along for the ride on. Absolutely, yeah. I'm 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 learning that, and that's that's the that's the draw here is, um, yeah. I mean, we are only as valuable as the the eyeballs that that look at us, right? So I'm a I'm a walking billboard at this point. So I, <laughs> how do I get more eyes on on the billboard, thus bringing more value to Puma and in turn, giving me more value. So, so it's like, I, th I think yep. about it that way. And I, I know that that can be, uh, you know, 
seen as disingenuous or whatnot, but I'm, I'm just being myself, having fun with the, the content and stuff. So I think I'm, I'm trying to find that perfect balance like everyone else is. So it, it, it's been, it's been a process. So I'm enjoying it. Awesome. Well, where can people find you, your YouTube channel, social media accounts, websites, or anything like that? Yeah, YouTube. Obviously, we just talked about that. That's the one that I'm trying to push the hardest. That's my uh, that's my baby right now. And that's just my name, Rory Linkletter. Uh, and then I'm on Strava, uh, X, and Instagram uh, as like my primaries. Strava being my favorite of all social medias, but maybe... All the, all the hardcores already know about that. So, um, yeah, uh, at the pop of links on X, which is a funny random name, but anyways, and then Rory underscore link letter on Instagram. So. Perfect. Well, I'll definitely link all of those in the show notes and the episode landing page. So the listeners can go and check out what you're up to and, uh, cheer you on in your, your route to Paris and beyond, but thanks a bunch for taking some time to chat. Thanks Rory. for giving me a platform to share a little bit about myself. I hope your listeners, uh, come along for the journey to Paris. No doubt. <laughs> Take care. Hey everyone, if you are here, you have stuck around to hear more about how I use the products that sponsor the Human Performance Outliers podcast. I have taken a lot of time identifying these products and brands, and I'm incredibly grateful that they are both products that I'm able to use sometimes on a daily basis, and they also are interested in supporting what I'm doing here at the Human Performance Outliers podcast and want to work with me. So here's how I use them. One of the reasons I came across S-Fuels originally is it maps my protocol perfectly. So at S-Fuels, they follow a principle of right fuel at right time. This means that they don't demonize carbohydrate, but they understand the power of a low carbohydrate diet. So throughout my year, I have ranging inputs between fats and carbohydrates, but they're always based in a foundation of fats. S Fuels approach matches that just right. It allows you to build a foundation in your nutrition with fats, but also gives you options to pull that powerful level that is carbohydrate when you need it. So in their product line, this is how I use it. Race Plus, that's their carbohydrate source. I'll use this for faster workouts or for races when I'm trying to defend muscle and liver glycogen. Train is their fat-based powder, which is basically a sports drink powder, but with fat instead of carbohydrate. Helps improve fat oxidation rates. I love it for workouts where I need some calories. I don't want to run a huge deficit, but I don't want to introduce carbohydrates. Side note, this actually makes a great high-fat smoothie as well. So if you're interested in that, check out my Instagram reels. I've got some smoothies on there that I've used this for. Revival is a protein powder that I will use post-workout and post-race a lot of times. This is something I can easily mix into something like full-fat yogurt or in that high-fat smoothie that I mentioned. Using this just makes sure I'm getting off on the right foot with the recovery process and maximizing my protein muscle synthesis. Next is Primed. Primed is my go-to caffeine source when working out. It gives you 80 milligrams of caffeine, but they make it in a way where it will help with focus, won't have jitters, and can help you with the fat oxidation benefits of caffeine consumption as well as the reduction in perceived effort. Life bars are my go-to snack. If I'm doing a pretty big training block and I need something between meals, life bars give me some healthy fats and protein that'll fit right into that. Finally, Keto 3. Keto 3 is a product that I'll use basically to replace anything I would have used granola for in the past. So I keep a bag of this around and I can sprinkle that on top of things that I would have previously put granola on when I want to keep the fats and the proteins high and the carbohydrates low. If you want to learn more about these products or check them out, head over to sfuelsgolonger.com where you can get 15% off your order. And this year, Stay tuned because I'm going to be doing a series of free sample pack offers from those products that I just talked about. Last year, some of my trail running friends told me I needed to check out this brand named John G. And when it came time to update my running apparel, I thought, okay, I'm going to check these guys out. I'm stoked that they want to work with me because I've ended up using this stuff for way more things than I actually thought I would. My main focus when I'm picking out workout gear and specifically running gear is how does it actually like sit on my body 
while I'm going through the different mechanics that are important to running or strength work and things like that. So the more a product can function the way it's supposed to, but stay out of the way, the better as far as I'm concerned. So they're kind of lightweight, breathable, moisture wicking type of setup works really well for me. Uh, They're shorts, they're AFO middle short. I actually got two pairs of these and I find myself using this for everything basically. Like I've used them for short intervals, use them for long intervals, taking them off for long runs, easy runs. I even go to the gym with them. So I need both those pairs. I've been going through them. They have an odor resistant uh, tack to it too. So I can usually get a few workouts out of them before I need to wash them. And I just find like my range of motion is great in it, regardless of whether I'm doing those short intervals, long run in the gym, doing uh, mobility routine type stuff or like muscular endurance strength stuff and all sorts of different activities. So that short is going to be in my rotation even when the the temperature picks up i got a couple long sleeve options too from them there's the repeat merino long sleeve and the rover merino hoodie so the repeat merino i've been using as kind of like a either a base layer if it's really cold out that i'll put on first and then something else over it or if it's just kind of chilly wear like a t-shirt or a singlet isn't quite enough and i may want it for part of the run but not all the run or Maybe I want it for the whole run, but I don't want too much, so I feel like I'm sweating profusely underneath that. This is perfect for that, so I'll use it over the singlet or just straight up first layer on and then something over top of it. The Rover Merino hoodie is one of the things that I'll use as kind of an outer layer. I'll put this over that Merino long sleeve, and this one has a few extra features to it. It's a little thicker, so I can get away with it in a little cooler cooler weather. But it also has like a hood that you can put up and then a face mask that covers part of your face that you can use too if it gets especially chilly out there. Um, I've been using this both for the running workouts as well as taking it to the gym from a transportation standpoint as I'm getting there. And then during my warmups and things like that as something I can kind of count on. Both these items are super light and packable too. So if I, if I do have a scenario where I think I might need it for part of the workout but not all of it, I don't hesitate to bring it because I know I can take it off and store it pretty easily if I need to without having to worry about feeling like I've got this like extra thing coming with me that is getting annoying. The next item I got from there was the tights. Now, tights are products that I am very skeptical about usually because I always end up having this situation occur where they either feel like too tight and restrictive or they feel like they're sagging on me. So I'm either feeling restricted by them or if I don't feel restricted, I feel like I'm constantly trying to pull them back up or find a way to like fit them on me so they don't sag down. And it's just this constant battle where I just usually avoid wearing tights if I have to. These ones are are much different than that. I'm loving these. I'm wearing these on all the cold weather days where I want that full protection layer. And they sit on me so perfectly. I can even stuff stuff in the side pockets. They've got these side pockets on either side. I put my phone in there. I've even taken my outer layer off and rolled it up and stuffed it in that side pocket. I don't feel like it's creating a situation where it's getting in the way or causing it to sag. Also, full range of motion. I've used this for faster runs and slower runs. And that's usually my test. If I can do a speed workout in the short, in the, in the tights, then, uh, that's great because that means I'm, I'm moving through my gait cycle smoothly. And if they're not sagging on top of it, that's a bonus. Uh, I also picked up their Atlas multi pant, which is a little bit more robust than the tights. So if you're looking for something for more of an outer layer, a little warmer, this would maybe be a little bit of an option. I've been using it on colder days uh, for, for running and just as a way to wear something warm to get to the gym or during my warm up during that. I love these because they taper down really nicely. So I'm not catching it on the side of my shoe as I'm going through my gait cycle or a movement in the gym, but they also have these really long zippers on the side. So if I do want to peel them off or put them on, I don't have to take my shoes off or feel like I'm fumbling around with it a lot. They also pack, they pack up real nicely too. So you can roll them up into the back pocket. And then if I do find that I'm taking them off partway through a workout, I don't feel like I have this like extra piece of gear that's like bogging me down much. If you're interested in checking out John G, you can get a 10% discount. Use promo code BITTER10, that's BITTER10, and go to johnji.com, that's J-A-N-J-I.com. And if you do like to shop at REI, they are also available there. Element Electrolytes has been my electrolyte of choice for quite some time now. They're actually back sponsoring the podcast for the third year. That's how long I've been using them. I actually got my sweat test done last summer 
where I found out that I lose 614 milligrams of electrolytes for every liter of fluid that I lose. And it's not uncommon that I'll lose a liter plus of fluid per hour, especially when it gets a little bit warmer. So I'm usually using electrolytes in my workouts, especially as they go beyond an hour or if the temperatures are a little bit warmer or if I'm just going through a lot of fluids for one reason or the other. My protocol right now is I'll do a half a pack of one of their chocolate flavors in my coffee in the morning before my morning training session. And then I'll do another half a pack to a full pack of usually watermelon in my fluids that I'm taking on during and after that workout. Their product specifically has 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. So you can go a long way with one packet. Some of the other flavors they have available are citrus, watermelon, orange, grapefruit, raspberry, chocolate, mango chili, chocolate caramel. They actually right now just rolled out their seasonal options. One reason to keep an eye on Element is they will do seasonal releases where they have limited offering, limited time offers. And right now their, their seasonal option is chocolate mint, chocolate chai, and chocolate raspberry. If you check them out and you like that sort of idea of mixing something with your tea or coffee or your hot chocolate, if you want to make yourself some hot chocolate with this, you can do that. Definitely check out the mint and the chocolate raspberry. I love both of those. If you do want to try them out, you can actually get a free sample pack right now with your first purchase. You just have to go to drinklmnt.com forward slash HPO. Put in that forward slash slash HPO and that will offer up that free sample pack, as well as let them know that you're a supporter of the Human Performance Outliers podcast. Delta G Ketones is a product I've been using for just over a year now. I started using them early last year as a a, a test to see if it was something I was going to want to use in my training and racing. I wanted to stress test them in something longer, so I actually used them at the Rocky Raccoon 100 as my first kind of test of will these handle for the duration of a hundred miler versus just what I would notice in kind of day-to-day workouts and things like that. And they are something that I'm going to keep in my routine. So my basic go-to is the Delta G performance. The reason I chose Delta G over all the other exogenous ketone supplements out there is they have a formula and a dosage that is supported by the research that we have to date. So they are the company that got the DARPA funding to design for special forces. They've been 50 plus published studies, 20 plus ongoing studies. My protocol with them is just to take a single bottle of that Delta G performance before a key workout or before a race. And if I'm going to be doing a race that spans longer than three hours, I will take another bottle every three hours while I'm out there. So if you're interested in more details about exogenous ketones and Delta G specifically, I would encourage you to check out episode 351, Exogenous Ketones and Performance with Brian McMahon. You can also right now on their website, they understand that this is something that is new for people and they want to make sure that you are using it right and that you know what you're doing. So you can do a free consultation with them if you go to their website at deltagketones.com. If you do decide, hey, I want to check this stuff out and see what my experience is like, you can get 20% off and let them know you support HPO by using promo code BITTER20. That's BITTER20 for 20% off at deltagketones.com. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. 